Okay, I'm going to have a, just a short special for you about St. Patrick's Day before we tackle a new verse, Ephesians 5.3. So, before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 tells, tells us, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments. I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for our freedom. We pray for the ones who are fighting to maintain that freedom, our military around the world. We're praying that you would protect them, encourage them, enable them to neutralize the enemy wherever they may exist. We pray for our policemen and women here inside America that they may be able to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. We pray for our leadership in America that you would raise up men who could guide our country by its constitution and thereby protect our freedom. We pray for our friends around the world, our friends in Israel and their military father. We pray that they might be successful in apprehending their freedom, freedom from terrorism. We pray for the Ukrainians and our friends in Korea. We pray for our friends in the Philippines, Father, the ones in ministry. We pray that you would enable them to carry your word wherever it may be wanted. Father, we pray for our friends on the prayer list, the ones that are sick. We pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are in pain, we pray that you would relieve their pain, remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who have lost loved ones, Father, we pray you be with them in their grief. Remind them of your precious promises, which brings a peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's St. Patrick's Day, and a lot of people don't know the story of St. Patrick. And I want to share it with you. This is the true story. First thing you need to know is that St. Patrick was not Irish. He was a Scot. And uh, most pe that is the biggest uh, mistake uh, most people have about St. Patrick. Patrick was born around 385 in Scotland, probably Kilpatrick. His parents were Calpurnius and Conchessa, who were Romans living in Britain in charge of the colonies. As a boy of 14 or so, he was captured during a raiding party and taken to Ireland as a slave to herd and tend sheep. If you, if, if you didn't know a lot of history back then, the Irish and the Brits, man, they fought a lot. And um, Ireland at this time was a land of Druids and pagans. He learned the language and practices of the people who held him. During his captivity, he turned to God in prayer, and he wrote, The love of God and his fear grew in me more and more, as did the faith. And my soul was rosed, so that in a single day I have said as many as a hundred prayers, and in the night nearly the same. I prayed in the woods and on the mountain. Even before dawn, I felt no hurt from the snow or ice or rain. Patrick's captivity lasted until he was 20 when he escaped after having a dream from God in which he was told to leave Ireland by going to the coast. There he found some sailors who took him back to Britain where he reunited with his family. And then he went to see, uh, he went to therapy and wore his previous life, PTSD, and he was ruined from then on. No. 
See, God gives us hard times and He grows us through them, please. He had another dream in which the people of Ireland, Ireland were calling out to Him, We beg you, holy you, to come and walk among us once more. But he had so much PTSD that he couldn't go back. No. He began his studies for the priesthood. But I tell you, one in ten, you've got to prepare yourself before you're qualified for the ministry. He was ordained by St. Germanus, the Bishop of Auxerre, when he had studied under whom he had studied under for years. Later, Patrick was ordained a bishop and was sent to take the gospel to Ireland. He arrived in Ireland March 25, 433, at Slane. One legend says that he met a chieftain of the tribes who tried to kill Patrick. Patrick converted Dichu, the chieftain, after he was unable to move his arm until he became friendly to Patrick. Patrick began preaching the gospel throughout Ireland, converting many. He and his disciples preached and converted thousands and began building churches all over the country. Kings and their families and entire kingdoms converted to Christianity when hearing Patrick's message. Patrick by now had many disciples, among them Beningus, Auxilius, Isernius, and Fiach, all later canonized as well. Patrick preached and converted all of Ireland for 40 years. He worked many miracles and wrote of his love for God in confessions. After years of living in poverty, traveling, and enduring much suffering, he died March 17, 461. He died at Saul where he had built the first church. Why a shamrock then? Patrick used the shamrock to explain the Trinity and has been associated with him and the Irish since that time. So, if you want to really celebrate St. Patrick's Day, you should either go out and evangelize or support missions, either of which would be a true calling of St. Patrick's Day, the Scot. I always find it interesting uh, to see what people do on St. Patrick's Day, but I think coming to Bible class and Learning the Word of God is a great thing to do. So thankful for St. Patrick and thankful for all of the believers who came from Ireland to the new world called America. And we started out with mostly Christians here in America and many of those Christians would have came in from Ireland. And so it was a Wonderful thing that Patrick did evangelizing the Irish. Okay, we're in Ephesians, and we, we have worked our way to a new verse. Yay! Ephesians 5.3 is our new verse, and we're going to read it first uh, from my New King James, and then we'll take it apart in the Greek. Let's take a look at it. But, conjunction of contrast, fornication in all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Let's take a look at it. This one. Ephesians 5 3. Our next few verses have negatives in them. We've seen a positive. It says, Walk in the sphere of love as Christ walked. And we saw that Christ, uh, because of his love, 
sacrificed. The first word in the English is but, and it is the adversative duh. It is used to emphasize a strong contrast between the fragrant of aroma of Jesus Christ and the stench of the old sin nature and the believer's negative volition. A strong contrast between the impeccable life of Christ and the carnal and reversionistic failure of believers in phase two. So we have a contrast. The work of Christ and his satisfaction of God the Father's righteousness and then the reversionist or the carnal lifestyle of the believer after salvation. They're the opposite ends of the spectrum. The next word is fornication. It's from the Greek porneia. It means normal illicit sex. Sex between a man and a woman in contrast to perverted illicit sex coming up. The next word, uncleanness, akarthseia, refers to abnormal sex. The word first came into the Greek language meaning refuse, dirt, impurity. And in a broader sense, it came to refer to the defilement of the soul. Akarthseia refers to abnormal fornication, such as homosexuality, lesbianism, pederasty, that's sex between a male, a man, and a boy, incest, bestiality, etc. But fornication, that is normal illicit sex, or and all uncleanness, that's abnormal illicit sex, or covetousness, we normally associate that word with, with money or uh, things, but here it's related to um, the pursuit for happiness in uh, sex. Pleonasia, it's a basic concept uh, for the word means striving for either materialistic things or striving for the object of one's sexual lust. The manner in which pleonasia is fulfilled is how it gets its translation. Can be dishonesty in business or frantic search for happiness in sex. Or any frantic search for happiness. It means an evil impulse leading to an evil deed. Or a strong lust leading to attempt to gratify this lust and calling it happiness. In other words, pleonasia means a strong lust plus the attempted gratification of that lust. Actually, all of the translations may miss, miss the principle whatever the context. There are many, many types of frantic search for happiness. Everyone at some time will be tempted in their own area of the frantic search for happiness. This is not limited to illicit sex. So, when you reject Bible doctrine in life, the obvious result is that you're going to try to find happiness and fulfillment in some other area of life. And it's all vanity of vanity. Solomon was the richest man alive on the earth. And he recognized that his relationship with the Lord and his love for God was the fulfillment of the human life. He said that is where you will find true meaning and true fulfillment in life. Everything else, if you look for happiness, if you look for fulfillment in life, you're going to find vanity, emptiness, meaningless. You will find 
that you dig yourself a hole and you have to put down the shovel and return to Bible doctrine to find fulfillment and find the meaning of happiness in life. And most of the people you see are hollow on the inside because they are looking for fulfillment. They are looking for happiness in some area of life. And they switch from one category to another, whether it's things, whether it is uh, their uh, circumstances, whether it is other people. They switch from one to another looking for happiness and they end up with emptiness, emptiness, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And so true fulfillment, true meaning in life comes through our relationship with God and our relationship is built through Bible doctrine. It's how we know what God is thinking and it's how we fulfill the plan of God in our own life. And so, therefore, if you hate doctrine, you love emptiness. If you hate doctrine, you love vanity. If you hate doctrine, you have a hollow feeling on the inside of you which will never be fulfilled, and so you have a curse. How do you get rid of the curse? If you're not a believer, first of all, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's the first step, the first question on the test of life. But after that, Bible doctrine every day. Learn the Word of God a little more. Take it into your soul a little more every day. You become uh, a stronger and stronger believer, and God gives you meaning, He gives you purpose, and He gives you a destiny that can be fulfilled in your life in Christ. And so we've got two opposites. We've got trying to fulfill uh, uh, the search for happiness out here. In, uh, in our verse, calls it illicit sex, but it can be any area of life. And then uh, I want to share with you at this point one of my favorite verses that is a counter to this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, every believer has a destiny. Every believer has a destiny. The question is, do you have a sense of it? See, we have a destiny, and it's in Christ. Do you have a sense of that destiny? Or is it just a faraway and fleeting idea? And in 1 Corinthians... 2, 9 is our destiny revealed our destiny revealed and uh, it says here but as it is written Isaiah 64 4 the eye has not seen that means you've never seen anything like this you paul said he saw heaven he saw things too wonderful to explain the eye has not seen nor the ear heard you've never heard a sound that has fulfilled you you've never been around any music any kind of noise that is similar to this nor have entered into the right lobe of man. You can't even think about it. The greatest thing you could think about, winning the lotto, being a millionaire, owning an island, having a Ferrari, a castle, a stable of horses, what, owning a country, whatever it is you could imagine as being the, the, the echelon of life, that does not compare. In other words, you cannot even fathom in this current life what God has set aside for believers. But which category of believers? So go on. The things which God has prepared, and that word prepared is hetoi mazo. It was used in the rolling out of a red carpet 
when a king walked in. And so for super grace believers, for material believers, they will be welcomed into their eternal destiny by the rolling out of the carpet prepared for those who what? Love him. Gate five and six, divine dinosphere, the beginning of the super grace life. So though, for those who re, re, advance to maturity through Bible doctrine, and they make it around to where they can love people. You love the unlovable. And, and the Bible tells us you can tell those who love God because they don't have hate in their soul for other mankind. In other words, they have agape love. They have impersonal love for all mankind. And that in turn is propelled by their personal love for God. Why would you love people that are unlovable? Because I love God. And Christ taking the nails and praying for his persecutors is the perfect example. It says that God is going to roll out the red carpet for super grace believers. See, you have to have your destiny firmly implanted in your soul and you have to see it as clearly as you see the things around you. For this life is short, but eternity is long. Any brief fulfillment that you may get out of this life that goes against God's plan is vanity. It's a frantic search for happiness. There's no fulfillment in these things. Why don't you look to an eternal future where God is going to fulfill the human soul to a capacity beyond anyone's understanding here? And you would stop looking at these little things which you think you get happiness out of now. There's no happiness. It's emptiness. It's vanity of vanity. Where is the real uh, fulfillment of the human life. It's in God's plan for you. The Bible says that God is going to, he is going to delegate authority in the universe to mature believers. I tell people, you, might, you, might, you see me run now, I love to run, but it's going to be nothing like when we jog through the galaxies. You may see me race cars now, but you're never going to see anything like my drag racing planet in the future. You may love to fish now, but I'm going to take you on a bass tournament on a whole galaxy that's full of bass lakes. You may love to golf now, but wait until you get on the driving range and you can put one all the way past Pluto. See, you have... You have no sense of destiny. You can't envision these things because you don't have enough doctrine in your soul. Right now is the testing phase of life. We're living in the test. It's a very short period of time where you can use your volition to glorify God. God's going to tell you one day, put down your pencil. That's when the test is over and you have filled out the little dots and no longer, you won't get to exercise your volition anymore to glorify God. You'll either be gone home and die in grace or you're going to be involved in the rapture. So right now is a very short period of time in which we can use our own volition to glorify God. You don't get to do it in eternity. See, your volition's locked in. Right now is the only time when you can grab hold of your eternal future in Christ, your destiny, and live it out in time. I'm telling you this with an intensity because time is going short. You may not get tomorrow. You may not get the next day. Right now is the time to live for Christ. For tomorrow is never promised. Well, the, the believers at Ephesus were having a hard time. 
grabbing hold of their eternal destiny in Christ and turning loose of vanity, emptiness, trying to gain happiness through the frantic search for happiness. I'm telling you, this world is passing away. And what you see around you is fake. It's a smoke screen. And the reality is coming. Let it not once be named. We have the ne negative particle mayday. It should be translated should not. Then we have the present passive imperative from the verb onomazo. It means to mention something. Should, uh, could be translated should not even be mentioned. The present tense is a customary present plus the negative indicates that it should not habitually occur. The passive voice, members of the royal family receive the action of the verb. The imperative mood is the imperative pro of prohibition. In effect, this is a prohibition of phallic reversionism. Among you is en plus the pl plural of the pronoun su should be translated among you all. As is the adverb kaphos, it becometh. It's the present active indicative of prepo, which means to be fitting, to be suitable, to be proper, to be compatible with one's status. There are certain things that you do not do, not because they are wrong, but because they are incompatible with your status. I think that ought to be an axiom. Uh, that ought to be, that. see, for young people, that ought to be something that um, guides their life because there's, there's always a question, what's wrong with it? But a better question is, what's right with it? Saints is the next word, the plural of hagios. This means royal family. Saint means set apart. Therefore, all the commands that are given are related to your royalty in Christ. So we have a good translation. But fornication, that is normal illicit sex, and all uncleanness, that is abnormal illicit sex, or any frantic search for happiness should not even be mentioned among you as it is proper with reference to royal family. So I remind you once again, royalty functions with class and distinction. We, have cla we are classy believers because we have the answers for life. You have the 10 problem-solving devices. You can solve any problem life throws at you. That makes you classy. And we operate with distinction. We are royal family. And we are not of this world. Our, world, our home is in heaven. We're pilgrims here. We're strangers in a strange, strange land. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. So, Jesus is our leader. He is our royal king. We are royal family. We function with class and distinction. I've got a couple of points of summary and then we're going to go into a doctrine here. We should note that there are two categories of sex operational in history when in relation to the human race. What are those two categories? First of all, there is legitimate sex. 
which God invented for the invisible walls of marriage. And we recognize Adam and Eve was the format for this, and Jesus Christ presented Eve after he constructed or built her. By now, he built her from Adam's rib. He presented her bow in the first wedding ceremony. Jesus Christ became the first anesthesiologist. He made a deep sleep. Adam fell into a deep sleep. He became the first surgeon. He removed the rib from Adam, it says, with violence. And then he became the first wedding official. He presented Eve to Adam. And then he had the first wedding present for Adam and Eve, and it was sex. And by the way, that was before uh, they could reproduce. And so it was a gift to Adam and Eve for enjoyment. So legitimate sex is inside the circle called marriage. Then Ill illegitimate sex, the second category, which is man sinful and evil. Remember, evil is distortions of truth. So you can distort sex. Evil distortion of what God has so graciously provided. Remember that God invented life and he knows how to get the most out of it, including the most fun. The castle of marriage has invisible walls which isolate husband and wife in marriage and cause their relationship to be unique. Illegitimate sex destroys the castle walls of marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Paul says, but because of every kind of unlawful sex, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. In other words, he was telling the congregation, if you can't control yourself, you need to get married and stay in the confines of God's law as far as sex is concerned. So we're going to go through a, a study here, and we're going to see a, a lot of different points. The problem is, is that Greek culture is was is totally different than what uh, we have now, and that uh, the Greeks uh, were raised uh, to um, grasp on to any kind of sensuality and any kind of fulfillment as far as life was concerned could if they had a chance to indulge in anything they would throw themselves at it wholly and not only that that some false religion and false doctrines said that uh, you couldn't please God unless you released that uh, desire and many times that was at a uh, they, you know, the, you've heard of the temple of Aphrodite, and that was the god of, goddess of sex, and that, uh, of course, the foundation of that temple was prostitution, and that uh, if you were going, if you had any kind of desire, it was to be released at the temple of Aphrodite and that you would satiate the gods. And it was a good thing. They saw it as a good thing. And so it was quite the opposite of God's plan 
four sex and uh, quite distorted in the minds of the Greeks at the time. And God invented sex and he recognized how to get the most out of it. And in the confines of marriage is where the sex life is fulfilled. Well, I think I want to take a go ahead and take our break early. So let's take a five minute break right here and then we'll come back to our doctor and open it up. Live and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to look at the doctrine of adultery in relation to Ephesians 5 3. Doctrine of adultery. Well, you're not an animal. And uh, the Bible tells us that Adam was in charge of naming every animal of creation. And if you think that Adam wasn't a genius, you're wrong. He was not a idiot. And it says that after every animal that he looked at and named, that he recognized no helpmeet was found for him. And that when Jesus Christ presented Eve, female, that he exclaimed, finally, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, I shall call her Eve. He recognized, he saw her as his counterpart, a female of the species. And so God you're, you're not only different from the animal kingdom as in that you have a human soul and you can uh, be a witness for the prosecution in the angelic conflict. In other words, if you go home and ask your, your dog, what do you think of Jesus Christ? He's just going to wag his tail and stick his tongue out, isn't he? But you can go ask another adult what do you think of Jesus Christ? And they're going to have an opinion. And so man is part of a spiritual battle. And we're different from the rest of creation and that we have a human soul with volition. And so when God gives us the parameters of marriage and he says don't go outside of it with sex, he, in fact, is giving us how to get the most out of it, how to get the most pleasure out of marriage and out of life. For he formed the human soul, and he knows what's best for it. So when you see the doctrine of adultery, you see it as a prohibition, but really what it is is the rules of how to get the most out of your marriage, not a prohibition. So let's start off with a definition. Point number one. Porneia, also a carfseia, and other words for adultery are used in the sense of any sexual activity outside of a divine institution number two, that is marriage. Now remember, there's four divine institutions. There is first, volition or freedom. Second, marriage. Third, family. And fourth, the nation or nationalism, patriotism, free market economy. And so divine institution is for the whole human race, not just for Christians. The Bible says even an unbeliever can have a great life if he finds the right woman. Sticks with her. 
So you find some unbelievers that are more moral than Christians are. The problem is, is that while morality produces a great life here, it doesn't produce anything for eternity. It's only for time. And therefore, while an unbeliever can have a great life in this life, there is nothing but flames on the other side of physical death for them. Sex is designed, of course, by God for right man, right woman. Relationship only. That's who you're married to, by the way. This marriage rep, uh, relationship protects the right man and the right woman. It must be remembered that sex is not love, not like the rock music tells you. Sex, when properly used, is an expression of category two love relationship. Adultery may be categorized as fornication, in some cases, seduction of a member of the opposite sex. Typically, when I talk about these two words, whether it's fornication or adultery, I usually use them in this manner. Fornication is sex before marriage, and adultery is sex outside of a marriage. But in... Uh, your context will tell you the exact meaning of each word, whether it is a karthseya or porneia. Point number two, the Bible prohibits adultery. It is prohibited in the Mosaic Law, Exodus 20, 14. That would be your Ten Commandments. The reiteration of it in Deuteronomy 5, 18. It's also prohibited in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Acts 15, 20. Colossians 3, 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. So the physical act of adultery is prohibited. But what is interesting is what Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Incidentally, mental adultery is prohibited. And so this is the life of the believer. And Jesus goes on and he says, if you look at another woman and you have sexual lust, you're gratifying sexual, sexual lust, you in fact have committed mental attitude adultery. So why does Jesus Christ, why does he prohibit this? And I'll stop and tell you there is a difference between recognizing physical beauty. There's nothing wrong with recognizing a woman's physical beauty, even though she may not be your wife. You can recognize that, and there's nothing wrong with it. Mental attitude, attitude adultery, goes with, I wonder what would uh, I do with this female in my own lair, in other words, if you will. And what a male needs to recognize is that you need to see your wife as your very own Eve as Jesus Christ has presented her in the garden. And that she is the fulfillment of what nothing else could do. 
See, none of the rest of the animal kingdom could do it. But there she is. She is your own Eve. And she was made specifically for you by God. And when you ruin that image by mental attitude adultery, you break down part of that thinking that's in the soul. So Jesus Christ tells us, look, keep Eve in your radar. Keep Eve in your crosshair. She is the one that God made for you. She is your right woman. Incest is also forbidden. Leviticus 18, 6, 20, 14, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7. We know the passage in Corinthians where believers, uh, where a man was married to a young woman and the man had a son, and the uh, young man actually had a sexual relationship with his mother, and they were privy to it inside the local church. And Paul says, it is named among you. Remember what he told the Ephesians? Let it not be named among you. It is named among you that a man has his own mother. And this was a believer. How low can Christians go is the question. Pretty dang low. And he says, kick him out from fellowship among you. Turn him over. And then when you read 2 Corinthians, you find out that the guy actually rebounded and got back with it. And Paul says, let him back in. And so incest is forbidden. Deuteronomy 27, 20. Homosexuality is forbidden. Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus 20, 13. And it's so easy to, uh, to be downtrodden toward the homosexuals. But the truth is, all of us have a different area of weakness. And for a homosexual, their area of weakness is being attracted to the, a member of the same sex. And so it's important that we not be like the self-righteous believers of Jesus' day that crucified, promoted his crucifixion, by the way, in that we measure our strength against another's weakness. In other words, you need to have compassion for the homosexual and the fact that they're fulfilling their weakness. And the truth is, they may not even recognize that uh, the Word of God says, hey, don't do this. It's prolific in our society to have this kind of sex life. And so the answer for them is, first of all, the gospel. What do you think of Jesus Christ? And then after that, post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, getting their head screwed on straight. And that may mean that they have to come set in Bible class being homosexual, as they are. They're not going to get rehabilitated any other way other than learning the Word of God sitting right alongside of you. Be careful about looking down on other people. Leviticus 18, 22 and 20, 23. Bestiality is also forbidden. That's sex with animals. Leviticus 18, 23 and 2015. Deuteronomy 27, 21. So point three. And this is an extended point. There are two passages which indicate the reversionistic destruction of the soul through adultery as a frantic search for happiness. The reversionistic destruction of the soul comes from the wrong attitude towards Bible doctrine, resulting in setting up the soul reactor factors of some kind or another. Reactor factors always begin with something like negative volition 
towards any authority of any kind. So once you go negative to Bible class and Pastor Brad gets, he stops telling you about your destiny in Christ and you lose eyesight of, see Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and we're supposed to have our eyes on him, our thoughts on him right now. Once you lose that grasp of your eternal destiny and you begin to get your eyes on temporal things down here, you get your eyes off God, your eyes off a of doctrine, and you get out here in a faraway land like the prodigal son, and you begin to get your eyes on what you might think would be a temporal pleasure that could satisfy you. You have not only gone into a reactor factor where you have rejected the authority of God's word over your life, but now you're on the frantic search for happiness, searching for, for, for fulfillment in the world. What, and see, God will let you wander out there in a faraway land for a long time just to show you that you're headed for the dryness of life. The deserts of life. And then one day, thankfully, he'll send your famine. And you'll come to your senses just like the prodigal son. How many of my father's servants have more than enough? So you have to recognize that once you go negative towards Bible doctrine, and your sense of destiny falls to the wayside, you become susceptible to the pleasures, so-called pleasures of this world. And what they really are is dryness, and they're really destructive to the soul. You're going to pile up some scar tissue, and you're going to have to recover from it. Let's go on with point three then. Disillusion, that means that your plan you think is real is wrong. What you think will bring you happiness really won't. Discouragement, that's when you, your plan differs from God's plan. See, you see the oasis in the desert, and you think that is it. You didn't see the vipers and the sand and the scorpions. And the sand storms of life and therefore you become discouraged. Frustration are all intensified by mental attitude sins. Such as bitterness, vindictiveness, implacability, pride, hatred and so on. These are the reactor factors that start because a believer is out of sorts in regard to the Word of God. In other words, it has its beginning in negative volition. Reactor factors under the activity of the old sin nature always lead to a frantic search for happiness. The one in this context is adultery. There are many other types. I love to watch it when Christians get rich. It is a test that God sends to believers and it is a curse to many. But once they pile up and accumulate a big pile of money, then they start thinking to themselves, how, how might I spend it? And it's so funny because... Uh, God, born-again Christians many times may come into a fortune because they're supposed to be supporting a ministry, support, uh, supposed to be supporting uh, uh, missionary activity, uh, supposed to be supporting ministries overseas, uh, supposed to be setting up ministries in their local, uh, their locale. And yet they don't realize what the purpose of this fortune they've inherited is. And so they go out and they say, I wonder what I can do with this money. 
And it's so it's it, it happens to so many people, and I almost chuckle. And um, I've never loved money that much, so it's always funny to me to watch what happens. And then they go out and they try to, you know, they try to do something with this money that's going to make them happy. Whether they move into a, a new neighborhood, and then they find themselves under the the neighborhood. Uh, what is the organization that? They, huh? Yeah, the HOA. And then they find out they're under a dictatorship. <laughs> uh, and then they, you know, build a big, nice house, but then the pipes bust and they ruin the sheetrock. And, uh, the, yeah, it, it goes on and on. And it's just one thing from another. They're trying to find happiness out here, a frantic search for it. And they direct their pile of money right towards where they think's going to make them happy. And it, you see it in, uh, in people trying to fulfill their lives. And it's just amazing uh, that they born again. They took a test called the prosperity test. And they failed it. And they, they get to a point where they fail the prosperity test. But then guess what it turns into? A curse. The money was actually a curse. And uh, if it was like old St. Patrick, he was the quintessence of poor, being a slave in a faraway land and destitute. What did he do? He pursued his spiritual life and he propagated it. And he found his destiny in Christ. And so... There are many people you see out here that are suffering and they may look like they have it all. And so there's always a question for them. What do you think about Bible doctrine? And that's their way out. Once they regain their purpose in life and regain their destiny in Christ, the vision of it, they can escape the reversionism that plagues them. So, there's three stages. Reaction. That is, the authority of the Word of God, they react to it. The frantic search for happiness. What can I find out here to fulfill life? And the intensification. Chasing it down. These are all already based on apathy and indifference to the Word of God. But now comes strong negative evolution. The total antagonism or total apathy or total rejection of the authority of the pastor. Or conflict may be someone with someone in the congregation. Whatever it may be. All of these things start with the next phase of destruction of the soul which is confirming of negative volition towards doctrine. This negative volition automatically starts opening of the matiotes we studied in Ephesians, the vacuum, through which come the doctrine of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. And as this sort of information comes into the left lobe of believers, now under the influence of the doctrine of demons, this is called demon influence in contrast to demon possession. By the way, if you're not familiar with modern music, the big push uh, for modern music is this fulfillment of life, which we're talking about, and they will give you all kinds of ways to be fulfilled. And uh, I love that song. It's talking about... Uh, the guy, he says, the name of the song is I, If I Had a Boat. And he was talking about uh, money may be this or that, the root of all evil, but if I had me some money, I could buy me a boat. And then I, I, could, bu I could buy me a cooler. And then I could fill a cooler with beer. And then he's talking about, have you ever seen in, anybody unhappy on a boat for the cooler full of beer and uh, fishing? And... Um, so he, 
he goes through the whole song and somebody somebody that doesn't have any doctrine well they say that's my motto for life i'm getting i'm fishing to get me a bass boat i'm fishing to get me a cooler and i'm gonna fill it up with beer that's how i'm gonna live my life my motto and by golly you can go to the lake today and they're out there and and so you are susceptible in your own soul to false doctrine without true doctrine you got it go negative towards the word of god and just find out how you can get mixed up in life and it's being promoted and uh whether it's fornication adultery or even a bass boat it is out there you can find it so no believer can be demon possessed believers can only be under demon influence demon influence makes a patriot into a traitor a conservative into a liberal, etc. All of the demon influence concepts cause a person to take in the doctrine of demons. And this is called darkness. This is the blackout of the soul. Causes hardness of heart or scar tissue on the right lobe. This leads to the practice of reverse process reversionism. In reverse process reversionism, you reverse everything that is good and right in life. And for your right pastor, you find where he's teaching the truth faithfully in the local church, you find someone else, your counselor, your influencer, to give you false doctrine. Uh, and for your right man or right woman, you have a faithful and loving spouse at home, you go out and you find a lover. And with that person, you fornicate or adulterate. And so these uh, things all start out with going negative towards the Word of God. It's very easy to get started. Just skip Bible class. And once you skip once, you find it very easy to skip the next time. And you go down from there. So I'm going to stop right here in our doctrine. And I want to end the day with a challenge of... Uh, St. Patrick, if you found yourself enslaved in a faraway land, what would be your reaction? Would it intensify your own spiritual life, or would you spite God? Would you shake your fist at him and say, why me? Uh, and so I want to tell you that uh, hardships are part of life. And uh, God designed hardship for us all. And there's a certain amount of pleasure in life for sure, but there's a certain amount of testing that we all go through, and it is made to make us stronger and to make us grow in Christ. And we're not to wear our weaknesses as a badge of honor. But God made Bible doctrine so we can overcome. You are more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. So don't stay there broken on the side of the road. Get up, dust yourself off, get back into the Word of God, and be a winner in this life through Bible doctrine. Okay, I'm going to pray with you, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for St. Patrick, and we thank you that he evangelized maybe even our ancestors. We thank you for the great country in which we live, the United States of America, and we pray that through the faithful teaching of ministers that uh, we might haul enough salt out to, in fact, preserve our own nation. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.